This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and ConstructionBusinessAccelerator.com. My name is Todd DeWalt, and this is the podcast for the small construction business owner. Got a great interview for you today with Spencer Powell from Builder Funnel Radio. He's a social media and marketing guru. And here's what you're going to get out of this. First of all, you're going to learn some of the biggest mistakes that you could be making when it comes to social media. You're going to learn about the platforms that you should be on and the platforms you don't need to waste your time messing with. We'll talk about inbound marketing, how to attract your ideal clients, how you should think of yourself. You're not just a construction company. There's a different type of company that you need to think of yourself as well. We'll also talk about some habits and routines of successful entrepreneurs, how mindset comes into play. Also, outsourcing. We'll talk about outsourcing and how Spencer has his team distributed around the country and even internationally and some best practices for making that work. He also has an open letter to Hows that you probably want to check out. Uh, we also talk about how to boost engagement, what performs the best when it comes to social media types, and a few other things. If you are interested in growing your business with social media, but you don't have the time or the interest in doing all of the work for you, then Spencer has a fantastic done for you program available. If you're a remodeling contractor, he has a done for you service available. This is an absolute no brainer. And he's offering a discount to you as the Construction Leading Edge podcast listener. Go check it out at constructionleadingedge.com slash social constructionleadingedge.com slash social to check out this done for you service that Spencer has put together that is going to save you hours of time. It's going to do a better job of getting your brand and your message out there in front of your ideal clients. And it's going to free you up to go do other stuff that you are better at. So go check that out. Constructionleadingedge.com slash social. A couple of other things that I want to let you know about. I mentioned outsourcing. I am unveiling a platform that's going to help connect construction business owners who need help with estimating, bookkeeping, co-construct operations, pro-core operations. Maybe you need a part-time outsourced CFO. Maybe you need help processing RFIs, documents. You need help putting together estimates and doing bid assembly and quantity takeoffs, but you don't want to hire a full-time employee. Then, or if you're a, let's say you're an expert in one of those areas and you, you're not really looking to change jobs, but you'd like to make some more money, maybe a few hundred bucks uh, a week doing this, or maybe you would like to do this full time. Then I've created an outsourcing freelance platform. It's over at buildwithout.com. Go to www.buildwithout.com and find out how you can build your business without all the headaches of finding, recruiting, hiring, training employees, paying for their health insurance, buying a computer, paying to train them. You, you can build your business by finding freelancers out there who already have the expertise, the experience, the software, and the know-how and the workflow to get you exactly what you need. So you can build your business without all the headaches that come along with employees. So go to www.buildwithout.com. If you're an employer, you can post a project for free. If you are a freelancer, you can create a profile for free and get set up doing that right now over at buildwithout.com. Also, lots of resources. If you need help selling, if you want to improve your margins, if you want to build your backlog, if you want to improve your cash flow, if you want to learn how to grow your team and grow your revenue without hiring more people or finding more customers, I've got lots and lots of resources at my website. Go to constructionleadingedge.com. Click the big red button that says free training or free resources, something along those lines, and there's lots of stuff there for you. If you're a construction business owner and you want to take your business to the next level, if you're running into roadblocks, frustrated, whatever the case may be, and you need some help, you can see it, but you just can't get there. I'd love to get on the phone with you. And you could go to constructionleadingedge.com and schedule a free call with me, and we'll talk through what help looks like 
and I'll do whatever I can to help you. But go to constructionleadingedge.com, click the big red button that says schedule your free call and uh, check it out. Look forward to the opportunity to talk to you. So there you go. Enough talk. Let's get to this interview with Spencer Powell and let's crack the code on social media. All right, Spencer Powell, welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? Oh man, it's going good. Thanks for having me. Right on. Glad so to be I was here. On your podcast a few months ago, we spent some time at the advance. You came down and spoke, and uh, you gave a, a short but very powerful presentation there on the six big mistakes that contractors are making when it comes to social media. Could you share two or three of the biggest mistakes that you see contractors making in the social media arena? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think for me, the first thing is really not having a strategy going into it. And I think that's where you should start going into most things, right? You know, oh, I, this idea popped up, let's do it. You know, and that's, that sounds fun, but okay, why are we doing it? Does it fit into our overall game plan and, and thus our overall strategy? And so I think that's really the first question is, okay, social media is a great tool. It's a powerful tool. How does it fit into what we're trying to do in terms of our sales goals, our marketing and lead gen goals, our brand building goals, all those types of things. And so I think the first step is really defining that and going, okay, what are we trying to do with it? Let's set, set the strategy. And then when we go to post, we can kind of go back to that strategy and go, is this in line with that? Or are we just kind of winging it or, or doing this to do it? <laughs> yeah. So, so how, um, and some people would think, well, I'm going to post on social media and then people will call me and ask for estimates or they'll just mail me checks, which is probably not. <laughs> what, what are some good strategies? What should people, what should they make their strategy for social media? Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, one is that you want to grow your audience because in my mind, your audience is people that follow you and they're interested in following you. And then when they're ready for what you offer, you've been in front of them, you've been building that uh, brand equity, the thought leadership, kind of that, you know, trusted advisor status. Uh, that gets talked about a lot, but that's really a great way to build that. I mean, if you have a following and they're engaging with you and they're paying attention, you're connecting with them, even if they're not reaching out, which is a weird thing because you think, gosh, we're just, we're posting. Sometimes people comment. Um, we have this following, but nobody's calling me yet, but that's because they maybe aren't ready. They're not at that stage. So you kind of have to look at it from, from that perspective. Um, so that's one angle, but I think another one is, do we want to use social media as a traffic driver to the website and as one particular channel to get more people back to the site? Because in my mind, the ultimate goal is we want them to get to your website because that's where they can learn about what you offer. They can convert into a lead. Obviously, social media, they can message you, some, some things like that. But the traditional path is kind of learn about you, engage with you oh, I'm going to go check out their website. They can look at photography, the team, all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a, a brand element to social media. And then there's also a traffic driving element. And that will lead to that lead conversion step. But uh, to me, those are the big ones. So, so then the next kind of question becomes platforms. You know, there's a million of them out there. So, you know, yeah, how do you decide? And, and before we uh, get into what you recommend uh, people focus on for platforms, I'll share one thing I notice a lot on social media, it's, which I think is a symptom of a lack of strategy. I see a lot of people, uh, not to pick on this group, but um, like people who are Finnish carpenters and woodworkers. They share pictures and stuff on Instagram and Facebook about stuff they think is cool, mm -hmm. but their clients don't care about. So they're building a following of other people just like them, which if that's your strategy, that's great. But if you want to build an audience of clients and builders and general contractors, people who will give you money, then your strategy needs to be different. You need to share stuff they think is interesting. They're probably not that interested in your, how your trucks are set up and <laughs> the latest fest tool uh, that you're, crack dealer slash Festool salesman 
sold you, just think about what it really starts with the customer. <laughs> you know, if, if your strategy is to build an audience and become a thought leader in your particular craft or field, great. But if you want to make money, if you want to sell work, then that's where your strategy needs to start from. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you want to attract the right people, right? And so if, if you're creating content that doesn't appeal to people that are going to buy your services, then it's tough to keep them engaged. And and that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of times we talk about, hey, we should create some content around like home maintenance tips and, you know, what to do in the winter, what to do in the spring. And they, and they go, well, I don't want to share that content because I don't do home maintenance or, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to do those small projects or why would I give away that information that's not even relevant. I do kitchen remodeling or something yeah. like that. It's going, well, it's related to the home mm-hmm. and that person that is maintaining a home could remodel with you, you know, so you kind of have to get over that. I want to just sell on this post. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. All for a free estimate. If your right. social media strategy is to offer free estimates on every post, you're probably going to be disappointed at the results. Yeah. Yeah. May not build that following you're looking for. <laughs> Probably not. That's sort of like saying, Hey, come sit in my lap. We just met. Not, right. not a good strategy for meeting new people. Um, so got to have a strategy. Let's talk about some of the platforms. Where should people, um, where should they focus their efforts or if they're in the construction industry and what should they not worry about? Yeah. From what we've seen, kind of looking across our client base and all the data we track, you know, traffic from different channels and then lead conversion through those channels. And uh, Facebook is still super high on that list uh, in terms of traffic driving ability and also lead conversion once you get people to find you on Facebook and then get over to your website. Uh, So I would put that way up there. Uh, House is still a great channel. Uh, we talk about a lot that the paid house program may not be the best fit. Um, and I don't know that we'll go down that rabbit hole for right now, but, uh, we've seen that they just, they're turning into one of those kind of lead farms or whatever you want to call them. And they're kind of sending the wrong leads to people and sometimes they're in the wrong area. And so I don't feel like you're quite getting what you you're paying for at the paid, um, but the free profile is still great because it's localized. People can find you on there. They can see your work. You can put budget ranges. So you can hopefully qualify a little bit and then drive some traffic back. And you know, everyone on there is at least thinking about their home, right? So they're already in that, that right bucket. So I like that channel. Um, Instagram, I would say is another good channel. I think we're early stages on it being a huge lead generator. I, we're definitely seeing it as more of that branding play right now. Like build that audience, engage with them. That's where a lot of people are today. Obviously Facebook's still the big dog, but Instagram is, is up there as well. There's a ton of people there and they're spending a lot of hours on that channel. Um, yeah. So those are three that I would put at the top of the list. I would uh, rope in LinkedIn. If you, um, from a personal standpoint. I don't really see a lot of traction for the construction companies with a company page, but with a personal profile, I feel like, hey, if you're the owner or you're a VP or you're somebody in, you know, that's part of new business development and you're networking, you know people in the community, that's a great place to kind of build that personal brand which ties to the company. And so you can share some content there. And so I would put those, those at the top of my list, Twitter, I just throw it out. Don't waste your time there. Uh, It's a great channel for some industries. I haven't seen it as being a good channel for this industry. Same with Pinterest. And some people might go, oh, Pinterest is great. It's visual. There's all these things. We've seen it can be a big traffic driver, but you can't localize it very well. So you just get a bunch of like traffic from all over the country and it's not really helpful. And I find that the actual percentage of traffic you get from that channel that's relevant to you is, is very, very low. If, if anything. Yeah. One thing you mentioned house and some uh, legion sources. One thing I've noticed uh, as I talk to some of my clients, they express their frustration with Angie's list and house and other services you pay a monthly fee for to get leads. And they talked about how it's like, Oh, it's all about low price. And, and I pointed out, well, you're buying leads from somebody who's selling leads to multiple people. So 
exactly. by default, you've put yourself into a bidding war and also created a situation where you're fighting for ratings and you end up running estimates that you're really not interested in just to protect your, just to, to avoid a potential bad rating. And it just becomes this, this monster that you have to feed. And my advice for people is let's go reallocate those dollars somewhere where you are putting yourself in front of your purple, your perfect client, putting your message, not buying a lead that's also being sold to two or three of your competitors as well. Like let's, let's go look at Facebook marketing. Let's go come up with some strategy that puts only our message in front of the people we want to work with and not create this monster that we have to feed. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you Google open letter to house, you'll see a blog post we wrote, which covers a lot of those things that you just went through and we, there's the comments are blowing up. So feel free to like go in and chime in. We're hoping to kind of get their attention a little because you guys are paying house. You're their customer, but they're not treating you very well. And they're kind of anyway. Yeah, you can read it. <laughs> open letter to house. Got it. Check that out. Um, let's talk about, a social media strategy um, that I see a lot of people using. If you really look deeply, you, you sort of have to look beyond the layers to see what they're doing. And Gary Vaynerchuk shared this. He said his strategy is to get on LinkedIn and, and get on Facebook and talk about something indirectly related to what you do. He, would, he may even say, talk about something that's interesting to your clients, but not directly related to what you do. So he talks a lot about uh, company culture and empowering people and things like that, which that's not a service he sells, but it, that that's part of his strategies. So how, if at all, can a builder, remodeler, general contractor, electrician, whatever they might be, how can they use that strategy on social media to do, well, first of all, does that make sense? And then if so, how can we do that in the construction industry? Yeah, I, th I think it's a pretty interesting question. And I mean, a couple things kind of come to mind for me. One is that home maintenance tips example I gave, which is still pretty much related, but it's, if it's not what you do, it's a little bit off the beaten path, but it's, it's related. Uh, but the other thing is really community. So you're, you're in a community and uh, let's say you are, you know, do some type of remodeling, you know, maybe there's a few areas that you like to work in within a city. I mean, why not talk about, you know, the, the best activities in the area, the best restaurants, the different, you know, things that you can do. And you kind of become this go-to person for the town, for the local area. And you're building that thought leadership. And this stuff is actually helpful to people, right? They want to know. So maybe they've moved and then they're going to need some services or they've been there a while and they're just like, oh, I never, never knew about that place or I never knew about that activity. Um, and people look for that stuff all the time. So you can pull them in with that content. And then, you know, to your point, it's kind of, it's unrelated, but home, you know, where people live, it's all connected, but just not, maybe not directly. So we've definitely leveraged that as like a blogging strategy and creating some content around um, different activities or places to, to go and restaurants and that sort of thing. And those posts tend to get a lot of traffic because that's what people are interested in. Yeah. So that, that is a strategy in and of itself is let's go talk about stuff you're audience and your potential clients would be interested in, not necessarily what you're interested in. Now, a couple of types of content that I found to be very good. One would be what I call the roundup post where you, I will um, share something that has multiple people in it. Maybe it's a trade organization and a speaker and it's just, Hey, thank you. This was a really cool event. I was at a, uh, an excellence in construction awards gala a few weeks ago for the associated builders and contractors just posted a picture posted a quote from the speaker who was the national president and i don't know that i tagged anybody else but uh, it got a lot of traction mm -hmm. yeah. you know, i didn't say anything about me i didn't really i didn't even offer anything but it 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 was shared it was liked got some traction 
And if nothing else, we're planting seeds. Um, I talked about this on a previous podcast episode, maybe episode 112, about four uses for social media that you may not have realized, but one of my favorites that does a lot of things for you is just recognition. So if you share a Google review or a Facebook review that you get from a client and then tag the people on your team who are on that project, then you're sharing that, that good review with everybody. You're also giving an attaboy or an girl to the folks on your team in the form of recognition, recognition, which is very motivating and it helps them feel better. It's also a powerful recruiting tool because the people who are looking at your stuff are potential future employees. So if you're not sure what should I be talking about, you can't go wrong saying thank you to people. You can't go wrong sharing reviews. You can't go wrong recognizing your people. And I think that's an important part of, of uh, your strategy. Um, yeah. So let's, let's talk about, uh, let's see, we, we talked about one of the biggest mistakes was a lack of strategy. Um, what else? What are, did we cover but we said we were going to cover three big mistakes. Did we, did we cover those yet? <laughs> yeah. So the, the couple other ones I think are, you know, not posting enough content, you know, that's one and then not leveraging video. So if you want to dive into those, I think, um, yeah, what's I'm, enough, what's enough content? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, and if you look at kind of the averages out there for different platforms, you'll see different things, but I mean, Facebook, you can get away with posting every day. And people listening to this maybe go going, oh my gosh, I can't post every day to Facebook or I'm posting twice a month right now. <laughs> you know? So that sounds like a ton of content. Uh, but that is, uh, I guess that amount of content is acceptable to people. So if they're seeing you on a daily basis, they're still generally okay with that. Again, I think you have to run it through the lens of, are you adding value to them? What's in it for them? kind of the, going back to Gary Vee, kind of the jab, 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 right hook. It's like give, 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 and then you can ask, but then give some more. And so, um, you know, at a minimum, two or three times a week posting to Facebook, Instagram is the same thing. You can post uh, once or even twice a day. There's kind of the sweet spot is what the data says. Uh, but even just ramping up from where you're at, if you're doing once a week or every couple of weeks, try to get to multiple times a week, even if it's two or three times. And I think you'll see your engagement start to go up, your following start to grow. And it's because we have short memories, you know, so people see your posts and then if they don't see you for two weeks, well, they may not actually see you just because of the algorithms. And so if it's like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. So you get punted way down. And so uh, it's a little bit of playing the game, uh, which makes it a little bit challenging because you have to create enough content, but it also has to be a certain level of quality that you're engaging your audience. So. Uh, definitely not here to say it's super easy, but I feel it is a strong channel today and, you, and you've got to be at least at a few times a week. Yeah. Let's talk about the algorithm. What, um, what is the, the algorithm? I, it seems like from what I can tell, most platforms like engagement. So they like, if your post gets more, the more likes it gets, the more it will be shared, the more comments and engagement there, there are more will be shared. Most platforms don't seem to like when you try to lead people off the platform. Um, for example, if you're sharing YouTube videos on Facebook, nobody may ever see them because Facebook doesn't like you to send traffic to their competitor. Um, what else, what, what are some of the behind the scenes things that, that are in the algorithm that determine how much our stuff gets shown? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that anybody really knows all the details, but there's been enough studies and everything uh, that people have kind of figured some things out like that. And really, I mean, engagement is the top. And so, I mean, you mentioned likes and, and comments and everything, but I would say comments and shares are worth the most. Mm -hmm. If somebody actually sees something and they decide to share it, they said, yeah, I, I like, I want other people to know about this too. And so that's a huge vote for your content. And so I, I would think about it that way too. It's like, is somebody, would somebody vote for this? Are they going to stand behind it? And if they actually take the effort to share it on their profile uh, or reshare it, that's a big one. Comments are next because it's so easy to click like or hit the heart on Instagram and move on. And so if you actually take the time again to write something out and post it, that is going to be more impactful than a like. So 
asking questions in your posts, you know, to drive those, uh, those engagements will go a long way for you. Uh, and, and the likes count, but I even saw something recently that Instagram is maybe considering removing the number of likes from the feed. So you can't even see because they know it's kind of become this poison like, Oh, I posted this. How many likes did it get? And then I posted something else. How many likes did it get? And, and really the value is in the engagement, which I would argue is a comment or a share. A like is kind of just like a tip of the cap or, you know, I'm nodding my head like, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think those are the big ones. And then uh, another way to just help your content is to tag people. So you mentioned a good example earlier where you can kind of tag employees or even tagging clients or you go to an event and you tag people in the event it gets on their radar and then that helps you get to the engagement. Maybe they share it or they repost it or they comment. And so then that helps. But I think if you just focused on engaging your followers, you'd start to see your followers go up and also any benefit from that. So traffic to your site, people messaging you, things like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. So ask questions. Part of the strategy needs to be engagement. How can you get people to engage in the content what are your biggest concerns about this? What are you interested in? What do you like? What do you like about this? What don't you like about it? What would you do differently? Yeah, exactly. Basically. Yeah, and you can, it's, it's simple in a lot of ways to get started, you know, show two photos of whatever it is, a bathroom, a project, and go, what do you like better, A or B and why? Uh, you know, what's your favorite element of this kitchen? You know, what, it doesn't have to be fancy. And, and I think if you just keep your focus on engagement, you know, for a lot of people, we don't want to overcomplicate the social media space because it can consume your whole day or your whole, your whole world. So if you just focus on, hey, I'm sending this out to the world. Are people going to think it's interesting and are they going to engage with it? And if you can check both of those boxes, like you'll be on a good path. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. So strategy, figure out who you are interested in having contact you. Who do you want to engage with and then come up with some content? that will boost engagement. Ask questions, I love the A or B, pick one, which one do you like better, what do you like the most? That, that, that's a good way to, to develop some, some warm leads as well. So let's talk about video. You said that uh, not using enough video is a common mistake. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, going back to the algorithm, I think it does play a role having, having video. Um, video tends to perform better than image posts, which perform better than text posts on the whole, right? If you have a really good image post or text post, it can perform well. Um, but I'd encourage you to just scroll through your own Facebook and Instagram feed right now and see how much of it is video. And you'll start to notice a lot. A lot of it is. And one, there's a reason uh, for that. It, it's working. You know, people are watching it. Uh, two, I think it does play a role in the algorithm, but you know, we're kind of lazy. I'd rather watch a, a quick little video. Um, and it's more engaging, right? So I can look at a photo of something or I can see somebody kind of, Hey, here's what we're doing right here. And this is a little behind the scenes. Look, check this out. That's way more interesting. Um, and so it's kind of that old, uh, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, a video's worth like a thousand photos, something, something like that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not super hard today either with your phone um, and you can just, you can be on a job site and you can record something really quick. And I find that some of those like behind the scenes things get the most engagement because mm -hmm. you, you talk about something and some go, oh, I, I had no idea about that. That's kind of interesting. I, you, you usually see the before and after. Well, now you kind of get to see in the middle, you know, what's going on. So, uh, and that's just, tip of the iceberg on what you can talk about with video. You can interview your team and get client testimonials and, and cut up these little snippets. And so um, I think video is the future and uh, I think you have to adapt and the people that, especially in this industry, which typically adapts slower than say like a technology industry, if you jump on this bandwagon and figure it out quicker, you're gonna be way ahead of everybody else. Yeah, I love the idea of behind the scenes stuff and a strategy that I advise people to use would be, let's go find some part of the construction process that has a, a hidden threat to your clients. Let, let's say 
if someone, if you're a custom home builder, one of the biggest threats to a client would be things like mechanics liens on their property. Or if you, let's say it's mold. Well, if that's a big fear, then let's go talk about how we flash our windows and show how we handle sill conditions and how we do our air barrier, moisture and air barrier. And then by pointing to that, you're showing your potential clients, oh, wow, I didn't even know about this. And if you're bringing up the issue, showing them how it's going to be solved, they will assume that you're going to take good care of them because you're talking about things that nobody else is talking about. And here's the other thing to build on that, which is hilarious, but can work in your favor. And that is go talk about something that is so normal and natural to you in your business. Your customers have no idea how that works, you know? So I saw something where it was a quick little video of a client. He just went to their job site and they were trying to stabilize something on the foundation. You know, I don't, I don't even know, uh, you know what, but he was kind of explained it. It was 20 seconds or 30 seconds and, and you're going, okay, this is probably something that every other competitor of his would do too. But because he's talking about it, his customers are going, wow, you know, that's really smart. Or and you're going, this is normal knowledge to me, but it's right. expert or unknown knowledge to them. So uh, sometimes you have to kind of dig out of your own head and go, well, I'm just going to talk about what I do. And you're going to feel a little silly because you're going, doesn't everybody know this? But they really don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up watching this old house, watching Tom Silva and Norm Abrams frame houses. And I thought it was fascinating. And it was the, the fascinating stuff to me was just the, the little tips and tricks and hacks that they used every day. And it was boring to them, but fascinating to me and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other people. Yeah. So it's the, uh, the curse of knowledge, the thing that yeah. you know really, really well that you think is boring. Most people don't know. And you just talk about it. it it's, it's surprising how much of an expert people will, uh, will think you are. So that's, yeah. that's good stuff. And the best part too, is it will infuriate your competition because they're like, well, of course. <laughs> Duh, everybody knows. It's like an yeah. electrical contractor saying, well, we use color coded wire. Our 12 two is different colors than 14 two is different colors than you know, 10 two. And every elect every electrician listening is like, well, that's a code requirement. Well, right. You know that. <laughs> but you're, Customers don't, and then when they walk into their house, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, uh, Spencer yeah, told me that my 14-2 was going to be a different color than my 12-2. He's an expert. Exactly. He's taking good care yep. of it. So <laughs> it doesn't have to be anything amazing, just, just insider information. Everybody loves, it, it blows my mind how popular these unboxing videos are, like on YouTube. <laughs> I've never watched them, but I've scrolled past them and seen millions of views. Opening boxes, people love behind-the-scenes stuff. So yeah, they really do. Just just pull out your phone, record a 58 second behind the scene video that you can upload to Instagram and just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, put it out there. Yeah, so uh, speaking of thinking about stuff, uh, before we hit record, uh, we chatted briefly about how construction companies, how remodelers, builders, all contractors should think of themselves as something other than a construction company. What what is that and why? Yeah, so my theory is that today really you should be looking at your company as a media company. And you know, we were just talking about video, and so that's a nice, you know, connector to that. But uh with the opportunity you have today, you know, even if you don't have the money to advertise on TV or get on the radio, you know, podcast, create your own radio station. YouTube create your own TV station, you know, social media becomes your amplifier for that content that you're creating. And really by thinking of yourself as a media company, you get to choose what that media is and you can start to use that to pull in your target customers and your target audience. And so you start filling some of those channels and some of the, the minutes, the hours that people spend on social online every day with now you're in front of them. You know, they're hearing from you, you're building that, you know, that brand, and suddenly you have this huge audience. And other than it is a big time investment for sure, or if you outsource it, there are gonna be dollars, but 
it's pennies compared to building a, a true, you know, traditional media empire, so to speak, with, you know, all the kind of outbound, you know, TV, radio, you know, billboards, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and yeah, with, with phones today, your ability to create that, the cost has gone way, way down. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's, it's, it's here. So yeah, you can fight it and say, you know, uh, we're a construction company. We've been doing it this way for 70 years. Well, then those years may be coming to an end uh, if you don't want to adjust. But the reality is there's a huge opportunity there and it's the industry is being disrupted. And it really is. Yeah. And I think we don't want to get hung up on thinking, Hey, this is only for bigger companies. Mm -hmm. People like to connect with the smaller companies, the local companies, um, you know, because it's relevant to them and it's important to them. And so, um, don't get hung up on that. You don't necessarily need millions of people following your YouTube channel or millions of people following your podcast. You just need the right people. And, and if you build that into a little community, then suddenly you're going to have people come into you whenever they need what you offer because you're there. And I like to give this example. I recently was at, uh, it was last year, I went to a remodeling show and I also run a podcast, been doing it for a little while. And people were coming up to me and going, Hey, Spencer, Hey, you know, you know, how's it going? Or nice, you know, I'm going, who are these people? And they've been listening to the podcast and the light bulb kind of turned on for me there. I obviously am a big believer in this, which is why I'd started it. And, and we're pretty heavily involved with, you know, video and this kind of stuff. But that was really that turning point where I said, wow, these people are just sitting back. They're consuming. I've never heard from them. They don't, you know, message me every day. But then all of a sudden, they felt like they knew me and they were comfortable approaching me, comfortable talking to me. And the same thing can happen for you when that person needs a repair or they need help on a project. And then suddenly they're going, oh, yeah, I'm going to call Bob. You know, I've been listening to his podcast. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. I already know who he is. And you've never met. And I think that is so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. The people your your clients will have seen you on Facebook. They will have seen you posting pictures of your kids' sporting events and restaurants you like and your experience at the dentist office and like, oh, this is a good dude. He takes or she takes care of her people. He is a he's a nice guy. He recognizes employees and there's this knowing and liking and trusting that gets developed before you even hear from them. And I would also say, I'm glad you brought this up about small businesses your the fact that you're a small business can be a benefit mm -hmm. people there's there are a lot of people who like to work with small businesses and they like the people really they like the people they like to work with people they like so if they connect with you and they're seeing pictures and videos of you talking about how you think and the things you like and then you just happen to do work that they're interested in that that could be enough. So yeah, I, I would not underestimate the power of of sharing your small business story and then really even your personality. I think you really have to. I mean, one mistake I see a lot is social media posts are just they're just like uh, they're just cold and they are <laughs> impersonal and stats. You know, it's stuff that doesn't say anything about the person. I think it's much more engaging to post something. Post a picture of yourself at some place or short video of yourself talking about something because you want people to get to know you, you want people to engage with you, and that that's really what you're about. And that's not going to happen by sharing some cold, impersonal post, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think for a lot of people, being on video is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so my big thing that I've kind of been telling people is, hey, when you meet somebody in person, that's what you look and sound like, <laughs> you know, you're just hitting record on the camera and, you know, it just looks weird because it's, you're looking at yourself and uh, to everybody else, it just looks super normal. So uh, take some practice videos, you know, do it in your house when nobody's around, just, you know, build up that comfort level. And then when you're out on the job site or you're in your office with your team, you'll be less, you know, afraid to just, you know, hit record. And the other thing is too, you can be with your team or be on the job site, hit record 
and then just don't post it. Build, build a few reps in so you get comfortable. So there's just, yeah, that's what I would say on that is just kind of build that comfort level with being on camera and, and talking and just sharing what's going on. Yeah, the first few, they're not going to be good. But the only way to get through those first three few is just to do them. And you're going to suck at first. It's going to be awkward and uncomfortable. But there's no getting around that. So yeah, just absolutely. delete them, maybe post them. Actually, I've seen some people post their, their first attempts like years later. And they, they pull these old videos up and talk about how terrible it was. But they'll share them with people. And I, I saw one on LinkedIn. It was this terrible TED Talk audition that a young lady posted. And it was awful from several years ago. But now she's a successful speaker. So it, uh, it was, it was an interesting post. That's um, cool. Yeah. So let's see, let's, I want to talk about, um, we've had some conversations about habits and routines. I want to talk about that a little bit, but let's, let's, let's talk about social media and let's talk about marketing a little bit. How, how social media is one aspect, one way to do this, but how else can people attract their ideal clients? to how can they get people to come to them? Yeah. I, yeah. I think, I mean, there's definitely a lot of ways, but I think it all goes back to this idea of you're trying to create something that adds value to your ideal customer. And so uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is always content, which is a kind of a broad term. And within that bucket of content, you've got things like blogging, you know, your website, uh, you've got content that you post on social media, uh, videos fall under that content bucket. Uh, and then same with like any audio podcast or, or things like that, but that, that's all considered content. And so a lot of people kind of think of blogging when they think of content or maybe their website when they think of content. And so what you're trying to do is create something that somebody would be searching for and then you have the answer or you have the solution to it. So a common example might be somebody that's thinking about doing a, a remodel. And so they're going, what are the, what are the kitchen design trends in 2019? You know, how long does it take to remodel a kitchen? You know, what is it going to cost? And they have all these questions. And so a very simple way to start with content is kind of the, they ask you answer. So, Think of all the questions that you get asked in the sales process, jot those down and those become fodder for your next blog, your next video, and then you create that. So as somebody goes to Google, they type something in, you're the one that answered it, you know, then they start to find you and now you're pulling those people in. So that's the, the high level of how, you know, how do we attract the right people and actually get them to come to us when they're researching. I saw an a great example of this last week. And I didn't realize how brilliant it was until Sunday, it was Sunday morning. I was walking around between volleyball games at a, my daughter's tournament. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that it just hit me what they had done. I, so I was scrolling through Google news one night last week and I saw this headline contractor eliminates the dreaded punch list. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Opened it up and there's this commercial general contractor and they have rolled out a, maybe, maybe this is what they've always done, but they, they're pushing out this content saying, we turn over our projects with no punch list and we offer a lifetime warranty. So what, unless they just stumbled upon it, what happened in the background was, I can, I can just picture this, Maybe they've got their media relations company, their marketing folks got together and said, all right, what's really painful for our clients? And somebody said, punch list, hate punch list. I can, I can attest to that. I've been real estate developer and owner's rep and I've had punch lists drag on for six months to a year and it's just ridiculous. Yuck. So they said, what if we eliminate the punch list? What if we say, when we turn over a building, it's 100% done. All the operations guys in the room are probably like, that's crazy. You can't do that. But somebody said, that's what we're going to do. And then they said, what else? Well, what else is painful is our warranty claims. Piece of cake. 
we're going to offer a lifetime warranty, not a 12 month warranty, not a two year warranty. If anything goes wrong in this building <laughs> for the lifetime of the building, we're going to take care of it. Wow. So they came up with this program that addressed two really painful issues for their perfect ideal client. And then they created this content around it. And then somehow they got it on a national news platform like Google news. Absolutely brilliant. It just looked like an interesting article, but I guarantee if I were a building owner and they targeted me and put that piece of content in front of me on a Facebook post or whatever it might be, Google ads, I would have read it. And then I guarantee I would call them if to see if they worked in my area. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Marketing. yeah. I love that. That's a great example. And, and yeah, it's, uh, what you also bring up is the distribution of that content, which is important. And so we spent a lot of, you know, earlier talking about social media and that can be a great social channel. Uh, I'm sure, you know, get on the news even better, but, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a cool example. Yeah. So if you're a commercial general contractor, go look for, Go hook up with me on LinkedIn, go through my stuff. You'll see a video that I shot. You'll see the, the article that I posted. And then you should go find out who's doing media relations for those people. <laughs> Hire them. They are, they're doing some good stuff. Um, so let's shift gears. Let's talk about, um, I want to talk about outsourcing virtual assistance, but we'll do that in a minute. Let's talk about the importance of some of the indirect things that have a big impact on entrepreneurs, mindset, health, exercise, diet, those sort of things, habits, routines. What are a couple of the things that are at the top of your list that you think are not necessarily directly related to business, but have that, that sets you up for success as an entrepreneur? Yeah. Thanks for asking. I feel like, fitness is definitely at the top of that list for me. And that is both the, the eating side and also the lifting side. For me, I, I like to just traditional gym, go hit the gym and do some different lifts there. But obviously, you know, do your own thing. If you like running or biking or whatever that is. But I've found that if I, if I get that right, then I don't have to worry about feeling sluggish or uh, you know, feeling tired. I'm, I'm more energized uh, when I, when I work out. And so it is that indirect that leads to some productivity in the office. And, and I think same with the eating and, and that's definitely something where it's been a slower progression uh, for me in figuring things out and what works for, for me on the eating side. I like food, you know, so I like eating pizza, I like having some good stuff. And so I've had to find a good balance. And so, you know, 90, 95% of the time, I'm generally eating a lot of similar things that are, you know, in line with, you know, my fitness goals. And then the other 5%, I don't worry about it. And uh, that seems to work well for me. But I find if I, if I get those two right, uh, yeah, energy level is, is so much greater. And I don't, I don't rely on coffee and a lot of those types of things, just a lot of water. And I find I don't, I used to hit that kind of afternoon lull where you're just like, uh, you're dragging, or if you have the wrong thing for lunch, it just sits heavy and, uh, and, and I don't have that. So I feel like that has been, been huge for me. Uh, and I know you, we were talking about this at, at your event and I know you've, you've taken, you kind of have some more, I think, I don't know if extreme is the right word, but very, you know, set ways that you go about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit. Um, I, it, I wish I could get back the hundreds of hours <clears throat> that I, I've, I've lost productivity in the afternoons over the last 20 plus years that were caused by eating the wrong food. Yeah. So like my food plan, <clears throat> um, I don't drink, but actually it's more about food avoidance. It's about what I <laughs> yeah. eat. So I, I took this from the Tim Ferriss slow carb diet. So it's this combination of intermittent fasting and the slow carb diet from Tim Ferriss. And I'll tell you the results. Um, I used to have some early indications of arthritis in some of my joints. My knees would hurt. My fingers hurt. I've got some arthritis on my mom's side of the family. And that was really starting to bother me. 
So I realized that a lot of foods, well, actually I found a list of foods to avoid according to the American Arthritis Foundation. So if they say that these foods contribute to arthritis, there's probably a good reason. So that informed, that actually gave a lot of credence to the slow carb diet. So here's what I, what I avoid, um, all breads, like six days a week I eat no bread, no fruit, no dairy, no sugar, no potatoes, lots of protein, lots of vegetables, lots of water, black coffee. And I combine that with intermittent fasting. So I eat between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. No breakfast, although breakfast is supposed to be the best meal of the day. I do better personally. If I don't eat breakfast, I actually, the less food I eat, the better I feel. So I have this, you, you gave me a hard time about my, my ideal lunch. My ideal lunch is <laughs> celery. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> it's it. okay. When when you go through yours, I'll give people my mine is like the opposite. So if, <laughs> if this doesn't sound like your thing, <laughs> yeah. So so that's what I do, and my energy level is pretty steady um, throughout the day. I don't have any crashes. I don't have any spikes. I figured out the times of day that I'm most productive, and that's when I do my the the work that requires some thought. Um, yeah, so it, it works for me. I've, I've gone through a few different iterations. I've had super high protein diets, but they just didn't work for me. Um, yeah, so that's, I found that really sets me up for success. I feel good in the afternoons. I can still get stuff done. Of course I do. I do hit the Dunkin' Donuts about every afternoon for, for uh, a shot of uh, a coffee with a shot of espresso in it, which is the best $3.00. <laughs> I spend all day, but uh, what, what's your, what's your yeah. diet look like these days? Yeah. So I, I'm more on the other end of the spectrum in terms of frequency of eating. I eat about six different times a day or so. I like to, uh, well, like this morning I went, went to the gym. So I get up at 4:45, and I have a protein shake right away. Um, and then come back and kind of get ready. And then I have a breakfast, which is omelet so three eggs and piece of dry toast um go with the whole whole wheat toast or a grain you know not a white uh white bread and then um then i like to have a snack you know mid-morning so uh that'll be either like a chobani yogurt or cottage cheese um, i go for a quest protein bar and those tend to be my snacks throughout the day so i might have you know, cottage cheese in the morning. And then at about two o'clock, I'll have my protein bar at four o'clock. I'll have another protein shake. Uh, lunch could be, you know, it's usually a vegetable and a protein, uh, maybe some like lighter carbs or just less of it, less quantity. So maybe, maybe a brown rice or a sweet potato or something like that. And dinner's similar, you know, so turkey burger on like a, a bun thin, you know, so keep the carbs low or sometimes just a lettuce wrap and, you know, sweet potato fries on the side. And, uh, and then I usually go for a, um, there's a like healthier brand of ice cream called Halo Top. It's more protein based. So I'll have uh, some of that. And so that might even be maybe seven times or more, but uh, I like to just kind of keep that, but none of the I mean, most of those are like a couple hundred calories or less, except for the meals. The three main meals are, you know, usually around 400 plus or minus, you know, 50. And I track the macros. So I'm, I'm trying to hit a certain carb number, a certain protein number, and a certain fat number. So for me right now, it's 185 grams of carbs a day, 180 protein, and 60 fats on most days. I alternate, alternate that a little bit on my rest days. So. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort, I will say that, to like put it all into your My Fitness Pal and figure it out. But once you kind of get in the routine, you can you can do it pretty easily, and and that really works for me. I did try the slow carb diet, uh, and it was very effective. It just wasn't sustainable for me personally, and so I just was like, I can't do it. I took it, everything to the extreme. So on the Saturday or whatever, which was the cheat day. I went way off the the deep end and I didn't feel good and yeah. it, it was bad. So, but anyway, you probably get, you get two very different looks uh, between the two of us, but I think it's kind of like figuring out what works for you, but, but sticking to it, right. You know, something that 
you're conscious of it, you're going, yeah, these foods give me energy or these, you know, I cut out soda. So I'm going to avoid these things because they slow me down or don't make me feel good or those types of things. Yeah, I think um, for me, I, I wish I had realized 20 years ago the effect that what I consumed had on my brain and my body. So not only did I pick up weights, but it killed my productivity. I can remember the afternoons getting into a cycle of drinking. Uh, th this was when they had 24-ounce bottles of Pepsi. I would drink one of those in the morning. And then not surprisingly, by mid-afternoon, I was was in the, this doldrum state, so I would drink another one. And then, then I would crash at about five o'clock, six o'clock, fall asleep. And then I couldn't go to sleep at night until like two o'clock in the morning. And then the cycle started all over. I was sleepy in the morning and I, I cut all that stuff out. I cut fast food out. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it takes a little while, but what, even though like eating celery sounds really weird, what I found is whatever you eat the most, you'll crave. So it takes a little while to get into it, but my advice for everybody listening would be just think about, do you feel groggy in the mornings? Do you feel do you crash in the afternoon? Are you always hitting energy drinks? And I, energy drinks scare me. I would avoid those. I see a lot of guys on job sites just hammering energy drinks. And I, I would be very concerned about that because they're not regulated by the FDA. From what I understand, they're considered a supplement and there's just all kinds of crazy stuff in there. But yeah, look at, consider the, the possibility that your energy level is connected to what you're putting in your body and make some adjustments, do some experiments, try it. Try something for a week, start eliminating some stuff, see what it does. Um, but it was interesting, you mentioned we were at uh, my event in Florida, there were four or five guys standing around. Somehow we got on this, the topic of diet. And most of the people there had some sort of food plan that they were on. Like, yeah, I gave up bread years ago. Or, I don't do dairy or... Yeah, no sugar yeah. was another common one. Yeah. No sugar was, was another common one. Um, so there, there are lots of solutions, lots of problems out there caused by food and lots of solutions. Um, so... Yeah. And the other, other thing I'd maybe add to that is uh, going into it, figure out the type of person you are. You know, are you an all-in person or do you need to kind of phase stuff out? I'm, I'm generally kind of a just draw the line. I've got to either I'm all in or I'm all out or it just doesn't work. But I did find for some instances that wasn't working for me. And so I was trying to cut out sugar and I, uh, it was like a glass of naked juice every morning with whatever I was having. So, that thing's got like 50 grams of sugar in it. And so then I switched to regular orange juice, which had less. And then that took like three months. And then I switched to the low cal orange juice and that took three months. And then I switched to water. So it took me like nine months or almost a year to do that. But then the habit was formed. It was solidified and I got to kind of work my way off it. So uh, you don't necessarily have to run out and just change everything tomorrow. Cause if you try to change everything, you probably won't stick to it. So, uh, yeah, try some different approaches and, and don't give up on it. Uh, being on the other side of it, I also had the soda thing like, oh, it's nine o'clock in the morning, Dr. Pepper, you know, here we go. And uh, man, just bad. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I tell people the, the half ass, half baked plan that you'll actually follow is way better than the perfect plan that you'll give up you know, on in three days. So yeah, I love it. I love the idea of start small, let's graduate into things, don't try to go cold turkey, you know, the whole go big or go home thing, not necessarily a great strategy when you're trying to change your behavior. Um, let's switch gears, let's talk about outsourcing. This is something that, um, that I'm working on. Uh, so if you're listening to this and you're thinking, man, I need a full-time estimator, I need a project manager, I need somebody to manage all my Procore or my co-construct or I do all my own bookkeeping, chances are you can outsource that, especially information type work. If it's done on or it can be done digitally, then there's this whole pool of freelancers or outsource providers, people who have the technology, the experience, the workflow, and the expertise to do these things in their part-time and on the side, part-time, maybe 
on a contract basis, whatever the case may be. So that's a, a platform that I'm working on creating a, a way to connect contractors who need this sort of work on a contractor part-time basis with people who can provide that service. So let's talk about that. I know you have some folks who work remotely, uh, you've used virtual assistants. What are some misconceptions that maybe you had to get over that are common with other people? Um, and then what are some keys to making this remote work arrangement work? Yeah, I think one of the misconceptions is just that the quality won't be there or that, you know, you won't get the the output that you're looking for. You know, oh, I can't be in the same room with this person. I can't see them. I can't, you know, communicate all the details to this person. So it's not going to work as well. I think that's a big misconception. And and I think uh, with some things, that is the case. With a lot of things, it's not the case. And I think it's a good, it's actually a good excuse to make sure you have really tight systems and documentation for the things that you're trying to get, those outputs that you're looking for. So uh, that was one thing that we realized we we're going, okay, uh, yeah, so we have, just to provide some context, we have a couple of people that are remote full-time uh, team members of our company, they were in the office, worked here for a year or two, and then they moved. And then we also have a, a full-time employee in the Philippines who has never been to the United States and we uh, have never actually video chatted or anything like that. It's all just been email and instant messenger and you know stuff like that. And that's actually how I interviewed him was over uh, Gchat way back in the day. He's been working with us for maybe seven or eight years. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you kind of start out with that first task. You go, okay, I've got this thing I need done. And the first few times is probably gonna take you just as much time or maybe a little more time than it would if you just did it yourself, but you're trying to set yourself up for the future. And so you say, here's the directions, here you go, give it a whirl, you get it back, and then you analyze and you go, okay, what happened here? Did I get the output I wanted? Was it correct? And if not, what didn't I spell out clearly enough and where, where's the holes in my, my system? Um, and then, and then from there, it just continues to get better because you dial in your system, but then the person has done it. They're getting in reps too. And so, uh, you build your comfort level and you, you're getting better output for it. So that's the, the kind of the first thing I would say is, uh, just getting over the fact that not seeing them or being in the same room with them is not going to get you to the result you want. Yeah, and that's a good point because I think the fact that you can just look over somebody's shoulder or go check in with them, that you are available, that's an excuse for being lazy. Like, yeah, we'll just we'll just figure it out. If you have a question, just let me know. And outsourcing it forces you to really think through the whole process, create the process, and eliminate yourself mm -hmm. from that, that process, which a lot of the people I talk to, that's what they say they want. They, they say they want their business. They say, Todd, I want my business to run without me. I want to be able to get on a plane. I want to be able to go travel. I want to be able to take a week off every quarter, every six months. I want to go to Europe, but I can't do it. And the reason they can't do it is because they just don't have this process. And actually outsourcing this stuff will force them to create a good process and extract themselves uh, themselves from that process. What else have you found to be a key for, for managing folks working remotely? I think there's definitely a level of trust that um, can either be built in advance or is built over time. And I think that trust comes along with just starting and moving forward and saying, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Here's, you know, here's what I need you to do. And then having that person be able to deliver on it on a consistent basis, you kind of start to build that trust. But I think communication uh, is really critical. And, and communication and being able to give direct feedback to this person, like if you get something back and you go, oh man, that wasn't how I wanted it. Oh, well, at least it's saving me a little bit of time. Or And you kind of do this, okay, well, I'll just take that and that saved me a few steps, but then you're still reworking it. Just continue to communicate and say, nope, this isn't quite right. All these things you nailed, but we need to fix these two areas. I'm gonna update the system. Uh, and just communicating that, that's gonna feel better for the other person too, because then they know they're delivering 
what you're asking for and they're going to feel confident and comfortable. Um, but then it's also going to get you to that end result. And so um, that's a big one. And for us with our two full-time remote team members, we use Zoom and video conferencing every day. And I try to make it a requirement. If you're going to connect with a team member, it's got to be over video, whether that's FaceTime or you pull up Zoom or, you know, whatever it is. But um, there's no reason not to do uh, not to do video today and just do an audio call or just do Slack and be chatting with them or email. Uh, and, and those tools are amazing, you know, and we definitely leverage those, but if you're going to jump on a call, why not, you know, and just, and connect with that person. And I found that, you know, adding that video component, it gets you 95% or more of the way there most of the times in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. And, uh, and so that's a big, a big one, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, Tools like Zoom or Ring Central, which is basically Zoom, they're very low cost and they could probably keep you out of airports and from behind your windshield traveling to meetings. If you're just going to go talk to somebody, you're just going to go meet, uh, there's maybe 5%, maybe 10% that can be gained by being there in person. If you want to pick up on the, the mojo, the whatever, you know, the feeling of the room, I don't know, but in my experience, 95% of the meetings I've sat through in the last five years could have been handled via Zoom or even a conference call uh, and totally. save thousands of dollars of, of time from having people, taking people out of productivity and having them sit in traffic and sit at a freaking meeting where, frankly, some of these meetings could have been replaced with a, an email, which that's a whole different right. subject. Whole so, other, yeah, whole other path. I think I the other cool thing about outsourcing, too, is that it it actually, depending on what you need, it opens up your talent pool to more skill sets. And, and so maybe, uh, and to some of the things that you talked about at the beginning of this part of the discussion, which is maybe you don't need that full time or you can't afford to hire that full time. So now you can get somebody on a contract basis. So just like you sub other stuff out, why not sub some, some office tasks out as well as some field labor and, and work in the, on projects. Um, and so you can get part-time and you can get really good skill part-time. Uh, and so I think those are two huge advantages is that you can, you can take those half steps, those quarter steps when you're not ready to pull the trigger on a full-time person. Yeah, absolutely. So if you think about, you know, I've worked with my clients through hiring folks, let's say it's a superintendent, somebody who has to be there on the job site. Well, there are all these obstacles that immediately pop up. Can I have, do I have enough work to keep them busy? Um, do I have to provide a computer? Do I have to train them? Do I have to train them on my software? Now I have to go find this person. They have to be available at the right time. They have to be in my geography or I have to be willing to, to move them. Then there are questions like, you know, they seem kind of silly, but where will they sit? <laughs> and how will they fit in with the the culture of the team and the dynamic? And I've even had people say, you know, I, I really need somebody in the office, but it's just me. And it, I don't want just, I don't want it to be weird to have somebody else sitting in the office with me. <laughs> and it's this paradigm that if I need help, then it has to be a full-time employee. Well, the beauty of, of outsourcing it on a freelance basis or a contract basis is, yeah, it opens up, it takes away all the geographical boundaries. You can, if you're using co-construct or Procore or QuickBooks, you can have somebody do that stuff for you anywhere in the world, as long as they have an internet connection. And you can find somebody who has the software. They know the software better than you. They have workflows that work better than yours do. They can do it much faster than you can. And it's going to free you up to do these things, these other things that you're better at that are higher value. So if there's a need, you, your first step really should be to, to try to outsource it. Try to find somebody to do it on a, on a contract basis, on a part-time basis. Um, that's my advice for folks, especially for small businesses, because it forces you, well, maybe you'll learn their workflows, it'll force you to communicate better and it'll free up your time to, to do these other high value things. So, um, yeah. And the beauty of that too, is that if you start outsourcing, you get to take that half step in terms of a cost standpoint, but like we just talked about, you iron out your system. So when you actually are ready to bring somebody on full time, 
it's ready to go. Like training is going to be super easy. And then the other tiny thing I'd just throw in there too, is don't let time zone be a hindrance for you either. Uh, you know, even if they're three hours ahead or behind, you know, you've still got a huge chunk of your day that overlaps. And in some cases that plays to your advantage, like our, uh, Sam who works in the Philippines for us, uh, we can send him some stuff and he can work on, he's working on it while we're sleeping. And then it's, you know, in the morning, it's his nighttime, but the stuff is ready for us to pick up the ball and run with it. So you can, you can use those to your advantage. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so we are running out of time. Uh, speaking of outsourcing and social media, you've got a, a service that you offer remodelers to help them take some of this load off their shoulders. Um, can you talk about that and then talk about where people can find you talk about your podcast a little bit where people can connect with you. Yeah. Thanks for asking. In terms of the, the program, it's called done for you social media. And basically what we heard from a lot of remodelers was I don't want to post all the time. You know, I don't want to post at this frequency. It's, it's a huge time suck for me. Uh, it's not my field. It's not what I'm in business to do, but I know it's super important. And so uh, that was kind of why we built it. And so what it is today is that we create content on a monthly basis for you, uh, daily posts for Facebook uh, and LinkedIn, Instagram is several times a week. And then we take our collective knowledge from our team. We work with a lot of remodelers around the country handling kind of all their marketing in addition to just social media. And we can look at all the stats and the data and what's working. So we create uh, these, we call them super posts, but it's, hey, this is a model of a type of post that got really good engagement or performed really well. So we put that in there. Uh, there's training videos, all kinds of other you know, material to help you be successful with social media. And so you can, uh, you can get there by just going to remodelersocialmedia.com. That's the easiest way to, to get to um, that program and get some more information on it. And then, uh, yeah, in terms of a you know, little bit more about us, we're a digital marketing agency. At our core, we work with construction businesses around the country. We don't typically work with two competing companies. So if you know we're working with somebody in a certain market, we're trying to help help them and uh, and grow their business. And our our sole focus is we call it inbound marketing, but it's that whole process of how do you pull the right people into you, convert them into leads, stay in front of them until they're ready to buy because they could be researching for a year or more, and then pull them into the sales process when they're ready. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got a, a special deal for construction leading edge listeners. Where should they go? Or is there a, a, a code or something they should put in if they're interested in that done for you service? Yeah, yeah. So we've uh, set up a code uh, for construction leading edge and it's CLE. So if you go to that uh, URL, uh, remodelersocialmedia.com. Just make sure at the checkout you use code CLE and we're actually doing a $40 off every month, uh, which is a, I think, over a 20% discount on the program. So a nice deal uh, for any of your listeners. And that's the easiest way to do that. Um, so yeah, I would say check it out. It's month to month, cancel anytime. It's, we're trying to make it a no brainer. There's so much stuff in there. We've even just launched this last month uh, there's micro videos that you can use to post to Instagram and Facebook to engage with your audience. So um, commercial free, free photography, if you don't have pro photos that you can use. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, I, I would say it is a no brainer. I've seen what the cost is and we did the math as a group in Florida. And I think we figured out that if you spend more than 10 minutes a month doing your social media, then Spencer's program is a no-brainer. So yeah, definitely go check that out. Um, also talk about your podcast a little bit. And then if people want to, if there's anywhere else people can connect with you on social media, where should they go? How can they get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah, thanks. So uh, if you're watching this on video, Builder Funnel Radio right above me. Um, but yeah, that that is the podcast. And we typically stay in kind of the the marketing and sales world, but it tends to spew over into, you know, business growth topics. And uh, we typically bring on different guests uh, like yourself, Todd, that are, you know, industry thought leaders, coaches, people that have done it. And now they're sharing their knowledge with the world and with the industry. And so 
um, yeah, episodes release typically every couple of weeks. So I would say just on whatever platform you like to listen to podcasts, just look up Builder Funnel Radio and hit subscribe. And then uh, in terms of connecting with us or finding us on social media, um, Instagram is a great place. We're just at, at Builder Funnel. If you search for that, you'll, you'll see it. And if you want to follow me personally and see all my, you know, antics in the gym and, you know, stuff like that, just look up Spencer Powell on Instagram and, and uh, you can follow me there. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast and uh, sharing all this information um, with the audience. Yeah, no, I had a blast today. We kind of got to cover cover the gamut in terms of topics. So thanks, thanks for the invite, Todd. I appreciate it. Okay, for all the show notes, links, and things we talked about on this podcast episode, go to constructionleadingedge.com slash 117 for episode 117 to take advantage of Spencer's generous offer to you as the Construction Leading Edge podcast listener for his done-for-you social media service for remodeling contractors. Go to constructionleadingedge.com slash social. And for everything else we talked about, go to constructionleadingedge.com. If you want to build your business without all the headaches of finding, hiring, training employees, or you're a freelancer and you want to turn your expertise and your spare time into cash as a side hustle, and you want to do that in a secure way that will guarantee that you get paid, then go to buildwithout.com. Sign up as an employer, post your project, or sign up as a freelancer. My name is Todd DeWalt. Thank you so much for listening. If you could take a minute, if you appreciate this podcast and you enjoy the content, then Leave a rating, a review on your podcast player of choice that helps get the word out there, and I would appreciate it. And that is all for this episode. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.